Loving God, to turn away from you is to fall, to turn toward you is to rise, to stand before you is to abide forever. God of grace, grant us your presence, speak to us in your wisdom, embrace us in your love, guide us with your call. The Lord be with you. Good morning. Please be seated. Friends, welcome to Westminster Church. I, you know, I have been gone enough this summer. I feel like uh, when my brother and I would come home uh, after curfew and we would burst into the house and say to my parents, don't pay the ransom, we've escaped. So I, I, I've not escaped. I'm just back to where I love to be. This is a, an amazing congregation. I got to take a little walk in Alaska for the last few days, uh, and uh, those walks were mostly in the rain. Uh, and uh, we didn't know where we were going uh, sometimes, and we pitched our tent one night on a riverbank because it was the only thing that was close to being dry, and woke up the next morning, and, and there was Mount Denali right in front of us. It was stunning. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, I, I get even more excited when I look at your faces because this is a congregation that has inspired me uh, so profoundly uh, for so many years. It is good to be back, and uh, I am glad to be with you in worship this morning. I'd invite you to fill out the Ritual of Friendship pads. They're found uh, along the aisle seats. If you would, please sign your name and pass those back and forth and take this opportunity to, uh, to greet those around you by name. Christ calls us to be part of a community of love uh, and connection, and I would invite you to, to see that everyone here is part of that community and you have an invitation to reach out and get to know someone new this day and each time we gather together in worship. Friends, again, welcome to this time of worship. Welcome to Westminster. We're glad you're here. 
Before God are all hearts open, and from God are no secrets hidden. So let us pray together. Lord, open unto me, open unto me light for my darkness, courage for my fear, hope for my despair, peace for my turmoil, joy for my sorrow, strength for my weakness, wisdom for my confusion, forgiveness for my sins, love for my hates, thyself for myself, Lord, Lord, open unto me. The assurance of Scripture is this, as far as the East is from the West, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Friends, believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. of Christ be with you. As we share Christ's peace with one another, let the children come forward for the children's conversation. Good morning. You know, our church service has many worship leaders, and this morning we are going to recognize the worship leaders that serve as acolytes. So if you are an acolyte this year, or if you were one last year, please come forward and stand at the steps. Every Sunday, our acolytes enter the sanctuary with their lit candle lighter so that they can light the candles on the communion table. This is the light of Christ that they bring into the service. And it burns there for the entire service. At the end of worship, the acolytes then take the light and walk down the center aisle and out of the church, symbolizing that Christ goes before us into the world to serve. You might not see that on Sunday mornings because many of you are in Sunday school at that time. Now at Westminster, children in grades three, four, and five are welcome to be acolytes. They serve in our Acolyte Guild, and we have two new Acolytes receiving their pins this morning. We have Aspen, and we have Colton. The other Acolytes serving this year are Julian Anderson, Derek Burridge, Henry Klein, Rachel Hoffman, Carter Mulvaney, Ian Mulvaney, Aubrey Winter, Portia excuse me, Porter Wojta and Georgia Wood. And we would also like to thank Teddy Kirkland and Jacob Tunison for their service this past year by giving them the acolyte, the acolyte pins that they wore during that time. Please join me in thank, thanking our young friends for this important role that they have in our Sunday service. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for the many ways that we can serve our church. 
Help us each to take the light of Christ into the world throughout the week. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the work you give us to do and the strength to do it. Now we present from your blessings this portion that we might be partners with you in spreading your love in our world. 
Amen. You know, the sons of one of our members is involved in the, the Kepler project. Uh, in the Kepler project, part of what they're doing is they, they take one of those giant space uh, uh, telescopes and they've, they've pointed it towards one small section of the universe and they've been looking at that same spot for four years. For four years, because it takes that long to see in depth what is there. I think the Bible is something like that. A lot of the time we, we breeze past the Bible too quickly and we don't see what's there. And sometimes it's helpful just to look in one small area. So I'm inviting us to do that for the next six weeks or so, to look at the water stories of Jesus. Now admittedly, this may be just a, a, a small part in the universe of faith, and yet it's one that I think has that has some profound things to say to us. So uh, you think about the water stories, and there, by the water, the disciples uh, come to be fishers of people. Jesus uh, compels the disciples to get in the boat together and go someplace. Jesus, on the water, calls the storm, calms the storm. On the water, Jesus invites Peter to walk on water and experience a miracle. Time after time after time, there are these amazing things that happen around water when Jesus is there. I'd invite you this morning to listen for the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father, and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus starts with no followers. In essence, he starts with nothing. That, in comparison to those whom he called, his followers, they had jobs. They were working members of their community. They were extremely busy. They were needed. They were doing what everybody did in that region and time. They did what their fathers did, the work that had been handed down from generation to generation. It was part of who they were. They, they were very busy and, and needed part of parts of the community. And then Jesus calls. Jesus calls, and this disruption happens. And what does that disruption do? I think perhaps it saves their lives. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning, but, but I want to reflect a bit, if you will, on when Jesus calls the disciples, they leave immediately, it says. And immediately they followed him. It's very clear that they're stressing that immediacy of their following where Jesus is going. What's the context that this is in? Why would they do that? Well, they are working on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is the, itself a very low body of water surrounded by these high hills, and the wind whips down the hills onto the water, stirring up huge waves and dangerous conditions. And those fishermen, all of them, would have heard or seen the stories of someone who had been swept overboard in those times swept off their boats in a time when they didn't have life vests. There were no YMCA swimming lessons, and you did not have much time in the water. When Jesus comes to the disciples, to Peter and Andrew, James and John, and he says, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fish for people. 
and immediately they leave their nets and follow him, what is going on? You know, for some folks, the way that they would translate this, it is that, that Jesus has this charisma, this, this authority, uh, uh, because in this story, very clearly, they've never encountered Jesus before. Uh, but, but for some people, it's that he has this authority, and so they're following him. But, but I want to question that, because we're not told a thing about that. What we are told about is his message, and his message is, I will make you fish for people. Now, of these people who had been out on the water, they'd lived their lives, they'd heard the stories of these people out, out drowning in the water. When Jesus says, I will make you fish for people, why else would they leave everything immediately unless they thought there was somebody in trouble and they could help save them? I think that is part of the immediacy of the message of Jesus Christ, that there are people out there who are drowning. And they are called to be life savers. And that's our situation too, because I think Jesus calls us. Jesus calls his followers. But we have to ask ourselves, what are people drowning of today? I think there are people that are drowning of loneliness. I think there are people that are drowning of guilt. I know there's people drowning in financial debt. And people that are drowning in the chaos of lives torn apart from various tragedies. And there's people dying because life just doesn't mean anything to them anymore. There's people dying of disease, dysentery, and all sorts of things that have torn their lives apart medically. There's people dying of cruelty. And of course, there's people dying of war. What was it our Presbyterian missionary from Syria said when we asked what does he need? He said, we don't need more weapons. We don't need more soldiers. What we need are changed minds. Sometimes that's what we have to offer to help someone's life be saved. The message of Jesus Christ is about changing minds. That's what he means when he says love your enemies. If even that can happen, then what else? I'd like us to think again and to claim the core of our call to ministry. There may be lots of things that we can do, lots of good things that we could and should do, and, and I'm in support of those. But at the core of what we do, we're there to save lives. We're there because somebody's going down for the third time, and they are dying for someone to reach down in the water and grab them by the wrist and pull them up. And that's our call from Jesus, is to save lives, to be fishers of people. And I think that's what we do at our best. I think the types of things that we do in our church, in our ministries, in our lives as followers of Christ is, is that that there are times when we recognize this is our time, this is our call to reach out and grab someone in need. I see that going on in all sorts of ways in this congregation. In the member care committee in the, and in the deacons, they've trained themselves, they've organized themselves to recognize the voices out there of people that are in need. And they're ready and, 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 and willing to reach out and grab someone and embrace them and let them know that they're loved. And if that's something that you feel touches your heart, then I need you to sign up to be a deacon today because you have to be organized for love to be empowered. There are people out there that are drowning and we have been called to be lifesavers and Jesus is calling you the question is, what way, in what way is Jesus calling you, and how do you hear that call? I'm sure that there are other things going on in your life, but as the scripture story says, when you hear the voice of Jesus, you have to respond. And the question is, do we hear clearly, and are we ready to answer that call? He's calling you when you hear and feel that sense of, of pain in someone else's life, that, that fear, that, that deep desire even. 
in, in, for them to, to, to have life. It says where Jesus is, there is life. Where is it that you see someone that needs that spark of life that we've been given to share? If we're going to do this kind of crucial work, we need to listen carefully. There's other things we need to do, and, and that is, as the stories will progress in, in the next couple of weeks, one of the stories we'll hear is Jesus says to the disciples, get in the boat. He says to all of the disciples, get in the boat. I, notice what he doesn't say is, well, I know you're busy, you've got a, you've got a hectic schedule, you've had a hard day at work, you need to take, uh, take it easy, you, you, you've got music lessons, you've got... He doesn't say those things. He says, get in the boat. <laughs> because there's some things that we can only do when we all get in the boat together as a faith community and experience the power that comes from us living together, sharing together, caring together. When we get in the boat together, there are things that happen that are miraculous and could not happen any other way. And part of that miracle happens because of the generosity in the congregation. I'm sure in the next few weeks, the stewardship committee will be sending us letters. And, and when that letter comes, I hope you hear that in, in that letter, a sense of an invitation to get in the boat with your generosity and give because that's part of the power of us pulling on the oars together and moving to where someone is in need together. If we're going to have that power, then we need to get in the boat and all do our, do our part together. I think these stories for us, these stories of Jesus on the water, are some of the touchstones for us to test uh, what we do in our faith and, and see if it's true and good and even gold. One of our core values is summed up in that word compelling. Jesus compelled the disciples to get in the boat. I think we need to think again and to ask ourselves when we think about Jesus, are we listening for that compelling call where he's moving us to do something immediately because we see and are willing to hear just how important it is. Where Jesus is, is where the life is. And people need to hear and experience that sense of life. When we come together in worship, our worship is something that, that it, it seeks to be inspiring. It is more inspiring the more that we all participate in it. If we're there to, to sing the songs, to listen to the stories, to pray together, there's a power that comes through the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, we're all together lifted up in sharing that good news and sharing that experience, that, those experiences. Where are the compelling call? Where is the compelling call that Christ gives to us? You know, sometimes I think we don't recognize and, and maybe we don't admit just how important the work that we do is, uh, how important our ministries are in the church together. I used to... Uh, teach uh, an adult ed education class in uh, Gallatin, Tennessee. Gallatin, Tennessee is just north of Nashville. You get to Gallatin just past Conrad Twitty's home, Twitty City, okay? You go past Twitty City and then you get to the little church I served and I taught a, an adult education class there and I thought it was good. It was, there were 30 or 40 people in the class. We had a, we had a wonderful time with it. But I didn't realize how important until there was uh, one day there was this veterinarian. He was a young guy. He was kind of a smart aleck. He loved to give me a hard time. He especially loved to give me a hard time when, when uh, the volunteers would win and the, the fighting Illini would lose. He thought that was pretty hysterical. And, uh, but, but one day he came and he wasn't dressed up like he usually was in a suit and tie. He had on his blue jeans and kind of a scuffed up shirt and his, his uh, big old work boots. And after class, he came up to me and he said, I want you to know that I got out of a mule stall and without taking a shower, drove 40 minutes to be here because I didn't want to miss your class. <laughs> and I realized that was an aha moment for me. It wasn't about me, but there was something about what we were talking about in that class, about the good news of the gospel that was really deeply touching his life. It was compelling for him. 
that made me take my ministry more seriously and, and to see more profoundly what was going on and what I was doing. So I ask you the question, are you taking your ministry seriously enough? Do you see that there are people whose lives are touched by your words, by your actions, by your love? That's the power of our call being embodied for us. What sort of compelling message are you sharing that's bringing somebody life? You may not even recognize it, but you need to look again and see because it is possible. That's the call that you have been given from Christ. I love this story uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew because the disciples are always called two by two. Two by two. Uh, because there is something about the nature of discipleship that is communal. It is about community. It's about brothers and sisters and, and family. But, but what they're being called to is a new sense of family. And in, a, and in a real sense, it is as if not that the church in this passage is about creating stronger families, but about the question of have our families prepared us enough to be ready to be part of the bigger family, the bigger family to which Christ calls us, because that is truly world-shaking and life-changing. Are we looking for that sense of fullness there? I just think these stories of Jesus calling his disciples are central for us. They're central for who we are because we are being called by Christ to move into that new creation together. And it is one where we will save lives as that happens. Annie Dillard in her uh, book of ex essays, uh, novelist Annie Dillard in her book of es essays, Teaching a Stone to Talk, uh, she writes uh, with these words. She says, we can live, and she's talking about as Christians, we can live any way we want. Uh, there are people who take vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, even of silence by choice. And then she says, the thing is to stalk your calling. In a certain and skilled and supple way, locate the most tender and live spot and plug into that pulse, end quote. I think that's a marvelous image that... that in your call, you're looking for that tender place, that place where you feel the tenderness, where you feel the life is possible there, and you plug in there. Uh, physicians, they're called, aren't they, by that lively place of somebody who needs health, and they can share that. Teachers, they're called by someone who, who needs to be educated and enlightened and empowered, and they plug in there, and it brings, it brings the other people life. A homemaker is claimed by a call to a sense of importance in child rearing and home nurturing. There are all sorts of ways that we are called. The question is, where's the pulse? Where's the heartbeat? Where's the place that it taps you into what God is doing in the world? The call of God begins with us bringing our will and mind and heart together to focus on what is most compelling in the call of Christ to us in that time and place. It's going to give us challenges uh, that we will not know before we start. There's difficulties that we won't realize until we're already there but when you say yes to the call it brings you to that sense of life saying yes to Jesus I think in some ways is like falling in love you know you don't choose to fall in love it grabs a hold of you and it takes you someplace new I think the call from Jesus is like being loved by God loved into a sense of new awareness that Christ has called you because you have gifts and there is someone going down for the third time and you are the one who has the ability to save them. God initiates. God has fallen in love with us 
Jesus sees the disciples before they see him, and he speaks to them, and he brings them to a new sense of life. In that sense, maybe the first ones to be saved are the disciples themselves because they said yes to where Jesus is calling them. May the pulse of the world be a sense of calling for us, that awareness of God's living presence reaching out to us, naming us by name, helping us to plug into what is there that will help us bring life. And may we see that for the gift that it is, that the life that has been given to us is a life that we have to share. It is a gift by the one who has loved us and called us and leads us into the future, the one who loves us all, Jesus Christ. Amen. you to uh, keep in mind all those who uh, have been devastated by the by the hurricanes um, but but I also want to, to have you keep in mind um, uh, one of our own families that is going through a very uh, difficult time Janice uh, Rowaner uh, was struck by a, a brain bleed yesterday she uh, was uh, non-responsive uh, yesterday she's been life flighted to, uh, to Omaha um, and we want to keep Kathy and uh, Josh in our thoughts and prayers as they're going through this uh, this very difficult time. And I also want to say how grateful uh, that I, I am for Robin Eberly and Diana Wild for reaching out and, and caring for them in, in this time. Those, those uh, times of uh, our community coming together in love and care are very important. Thank you. In addition, we do have 
uh, births to celebrate, twins, Maxwell Kirker and Parker Margaret, born on August 28th to Jessica, Mike, and Mike, um, yes, old men. Let us pray. Good Lord, in this last few weeks, tragedies have unfolded before us with startling rapidity. We pray for the Rohingya refugees fleeing Myanmar for Bangladesh, for the victims and families of the earthquake in Mexico, for those who have suffered through the hurricane in Texas and Louisiana, the hurricane that now engulfs Florida, which in days past destroyed so much of the Caribbean. Be with all those affected by nature's fury and the trials of war. We pray for those who are sick, infirm, and in sorrow. For Lord, we commend to your care our souls and our bodies, our minds and our thoughts, our health and our work, our parents, our children, our families, our neighbors and friends, our life and our death. We place them all in your hands, and we do so in the name of Jesus, who teaches us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus calls us to go out into the world. May we hear that call. Whatever it is that he calls, may we remember that that call is for us. May we go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the love of God, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us on our journeys, now and always. Amen. <laughs>